So uh, while you were out having the lamingtons, which I might add were colour coordinated with my shirt especially, uh, a little form was placed on each of your tables. That form, ladies and gentlemen, is both your evaluation form and your golden ticket into the prize draw for a Microsoft Surface. Uh, so I encourage you to both give feedback and hand your form in uh, at the end of this session and we'll put you in the draw. Um, my colleague Anna Tarasoff is presenting with me. Um, she's going to come up and give, give you some demos uh, shortly. Uh, I'm going to do my usual storytelling quasi-philosophical, heaven spit it out Chris, blah blah, uh, before we get there. I'm going to talk about data. Um, I think this is probably the biggest area that Australasian companies sort of leave money on the table when we compare ourselves to our North American peers, um, which means there's a huge opportunity. Who knows who Tim Berners-Lee was, or is? World Wide Web. So I will tell, yeah, well, quite a few people. I'll tell you folks, you are, did much better than the Australians did on, uh, uh, on, on the earlier in the week. Um, they didn't do well on Monday. One person knew, and he was our guest speaker. <laughs> Helium balloons. Um, so the helium industry is an interesting industry. Um, and that helium is basically, well, for a long time has been a byproduct of the natural gas industry. You get the gas out of the ground, and you get a bit of helium out of it, and that's great, gives you a squeaky voice and makes balloons fly, and it's important for a few industrial processes. And uh, over time, that helium has become so valuable that now we have a situation where natural gas is the byproduct of the helium industry. Um, and I think data is a little bit like that. There's a huge opportunity for us to start thinking about the data that is generated um, sort of by default as we go about using the systems and processes within our businesses. And think of that as a byproduct that we're maybe not taking as much use of as we could yet. And indeed, a byproduct that at some point may become more valuable than the process itself. Who uses uh, Google Analytics? This is an okay room to put your hand up in. So we'll, we'll call that, it's about right, 50%. Um, so it is used by 50% of the top 1 million sites in the world. Um, Google gets a really nice byproduct out of the fact that all of you people use Google Analytics. That nice byproduct is they get you, through complete volition, of your own accord to drop a nice piece of JavaScript into every single one of your web pages that feeds a huge amount of data about your website, in many ways your business and company and your customers and visitors, up to Google and they then use that um, to sell advertising and make lots and lots of money out of it. Um, and so that's a really interesting situation you know, in that they are effectively um, you know, using your data uh, as a key part of their business. And so when we think about competitive advantage, you know, how are companies deriving their competitive advantage these days? Who can, who can give me the three, what are the three pillars of competitive advantage from, from Mr. Michael Porter? Surely someone is like a former management consultant and can give me, give me some of these. As he left the room, I'm winding him up. Speed to market? is not one of his three. Cost leadership, differentiation, focus. Right? Well, that's actually getting really rather hard. One of the problems is your customers can do math. Um, anyone from the retail sector? Any retailers? Where's there a couple of you retailers? Um, I am the sort of customer you really love to hate to hate to love. Um, so I have, I have little robots that are roaming the internet all day and all night, um, seeking out the best deals. Um, basically scouring the data of the World Wide Web, finding me what I want. Um, and I'm sharing that information and that knowledge and that data with my friends and colleagues. Um, you know, and so the idea that you can make a margin, um, you know, sort of by um, by simple dint of the fact that you've got some sort of exclusive distributorship to a product these days is just, is just gone. 
Um, you know, customers have free access to the global market and customers have free access to all of the data within that global market. And it really is becoming a bit of a problem. And that problem is really all about transparency. Right? Um, I, I do a bit of work with uh, a big company who you may have heard of, uh, based in the United States of America, helping them with some uh, sort of technical strategy around some of their cloud platform. And they're putting together uh, an interesting cloud platform that is itself built on top of another part of their cloud platform, and then they're going to go and sell that. Um, and they said, you know, how much do we think that should cost? And so I said, well, we can, you know, we can build a pretty simple you know, model of it, and we can you know, model out what the costs look like and how much they're going to save in terms of upfront build cost, and um, you know, we can you know, look at what, that's, what that actually you know, is worth to us and based on the, the weight of average cost of capital, and they're thinking, oh, this is bloody trendy. Um, and so we came out with a number, and they said, well, that's not quite as much as we were after. <laughs> um, and the problem is that you know, economies of scale, right, Everybody can have economies of scale now. I mean, that's, cloud computing means that everybody gets economies of scale. Um, and so if I'm going to build it myself, I, I really have the same cost base these days as a really big provider, you know, even the biggest provider who's buying these services from themselves. And so it becomes quite challenging. And so I said to them, you know, what you need to be able to sell me is something that I can't have myself. You need to have some way of selling me something unique. How about we try and make that something unique something like data? You're going to have all of these customers using this platform, and you're going to be able to watch the way they use it and learn from that. And maybe you could watch the way that I use it and apply that data to alerting me if you think something's going wrong. Right? If you collect all of this data and you can provide additional services off the back of that data, that I value, that's not something I can do myself. Why not? Well, because I can't go and get that data. All right? So the key thing to think about here is what value can we get out of data and how can we bring that data to bear in our products to sell customers something that they can't have themselves? All right? Because that data then becomes your secret source. All right? It is the ultimate trade secret. Because if your data is actually a byproduct, of all of the great services you've been delivering and all of the great business that you've been running, nobody else can get that data without going and effectively winding back time. Anybody see that they, they announced there's a hoverboard coming this morning? So I just, I, Back to the Future? Anybody watch Back to the Future? So totally, go to Kickstarter. There's this crowd in San Francisco, right, who are selling a hoverboard. Um, $10,000 each, which is and you've got to have like a copper half pipe ramp. But anyway, uh, these companies need to wind back, wind back time right, to reproduce this data. That's impossible to do. Right? You know, and unlike the, you know, the 11 herbs and spices that, that make Kentucky Fried Chicken unique, this stuff's really hard to take off with. Right? So no one's going to lift that data and be able to go and, and compete with you. And so data is the new competitive advantage. Um, who knows what this is? Nobody knows what it is. It's a phone, heavens. It's a phone. It has 512 megs of RAM, 8 gigs of storage, Bluetooth 4.0, 4G cellular, Wi-Fi, 7 gigs of free cloud storage, a 4.7 inch HD LCD screen, and if I do say so myself, a rather sophisticated and modern operating system. Um, it's pretty, that, 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 they're pretty well priced. I'll show you what it costs shortly. Who knows what this is? It's a Fitbit. Awesome. It does not have 512 megs of RAM, nor does it have 8 gigs of storage. It has a little bit of Bluetooth 4.0, specifically the low energy portion of Bluetooth 4.0. It doesn't have 4G cellular. It doesn't have Wi-Fi. It has a smidgen of cloud storage, certainly nothing like uh, 7 gigabytes. And indeed, if you want your data out of their cloud storage, you've got to pay them some extra money. Um, it doesn't have a 4.7-inch LCD screen. It does have five little lights. Um, they're quite bright. Um, and it's done with a sack of hammers. 
Um, and so I went to, uh, I went to JB Hi-Fi, I think I love about JB Hi-Fi is that it's yellow. Um, so I went to JB Hi-Fi in Australia and I looked at getting some of these on the weekend. And have we gone completely bonkers, ladies and gentlemen? Because the bill of materials cost from the man in Shenzhen on that Fitbit, I think it would struggle to make five bucks. All right, so someone's making a great margin on that. How are they making that margin? Desire. How are they getting that desire? Well, there's a bit of marketing. What am I really buying when I'm buying into Fitbit? I have one. I have it here. Data, right? What Fitbit are doing is they are encouraging and convincing people like me to go and buy this device and to feed my data into their cloud, and then they take that data that I'm putting into their cloud and they do a little transformation, a little bit of dashboarding, and then they effectively, by dint of charging an enormous margin over the top of their bill of materials, they effectively sell my data to my friend group to make them all buy into Fitbit so that we can have this silly bloody challenge of walking the number of steps against each other. And it's extremely hard to go now and break into that market. Why? Well, because everybody's on Fitbit, right? And if you want to, if you want to compete with uh, Frank Arrigo from Australia, who also wears loud shirts, uh, or Nigel from, is Nigel from Microsoft here today? He's not. If you want to compete with, you know, your friends who are hitting the most steps, you've got to be on this platform that's got their data on it. Right? And then what they do is they just shut the gate to you getting your data out, and they say, if you want your data out, you can pay us some more money. It's absolutely brilliant. Is anybody doing anything like this at the moment? This is differentiate. This is competing with data. This is selling customers something that they can't. Was that, was that I was getting too excited? <laughs> this is selling people something they can't. They can't get any other, they can't get themselves, right? You can't build a new business that suddenly collects all of this data because the data is in of itself a byproduct of what you're really selling. So, that brings us to talking a little bit about big data. Who's doing big data at the moment? Anybody think they're doing big data? Can I ask what you're doing, sir? Laser scanning point cloud. I will grant you that that is probably big data. Data is when uh, the size of the data is part of the problem. Right, with data science, everything looks like a dog, and all dogs, in many ways, do similar things. Um, but some dogs are significantly bigger than others, and if you get a really big dog, you have to get one of those horrible Toyota Corolla station wagons with the really high top. You know the ones imported from Jap Japan? Like the carrots with the really high top? Has, has anyone seen one of those? I had a friend who owned one. He was really proud. He didn't even have a big dog. Um, so big data is when the size of the data becomes part of your problem. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. Right? The important thing to think about with big data is um, that it's really been driven by the economics around three key pillars. The first is that computing is getting very, very cheap. And it's getting cheap for, for two reasons. You know, one is the cost of hardware, um, Fitbit notwithstanding, is being driven to zero. Right? Um, the other is that we can now procure this computing power from these massive data centers in the cloud. And the key benefit there is we get to take advantage of being able to buy it in small increments because we're buying it from a big pool of resources along with a whole bunch of other people, much like we buy our electricity. So it means we've effectively got a supercomputer on tap, limited only by the credit limit on our credit card. Get yourself an American Express, no credit limit, off you go. Neewa, here we go. Um, and it's fascinating because some of these cloud data centers, you can now uh, rent by the hour massive servers in these data centers full of graphics cards, <laughs> right? It's in some windowless room in Singapore and it's full of graphics cards. Who wants to hazard a guess why it's full of graphics cards? What are graphics cards great at? Gaming? They're 
rendering. Why are they great at rendering? Graphics cards can do fractions, right? Graphics cards are great at doing floating point arithmetic, the sorts of calculations you might need when you're doing some of these massive data crunching tasks. So literally, these are servers full of graphics cards. We have them by the hour, and it is dirt cheap when you think about it like that, right? Because you, you know, you're literally paying cents, a few, few dollars, for the sort of supercomputer that the folks at MIWA pay tens of millions of dollars to have sitting in their bunker in Wellington. So computing is being driven down in price. Storage is being driven down in price, and not just any old sort of storage. So if your plan is to compete on data, right, is to collect this really valuable byproduct of your business processes and use it to um, deliver a competitive advantage, you need to put that data somewhere that's safe. Now, we are great at doing safe storage in our data centers. We have SANS, and we have tape backups, and we have armor guard men who drive around and pick up the tapes and take it down to the bank and put it in the vault. Um, the problem with that is it's rather expensive. Any CIOs in the room? Anybody able to do storage for a cent a gig a month that's, that's durable in perpetuity. So that's where we're at now, right? We are at the point where storage, like robust, guaranteed to exist into perpetuity level of storage is down to one cent per gig per month. If you think about the sorts of data, point clouds accepted, sir, um, that we're liable to want to store, transactional data, temporal data, maybe some basic geospatial data, it's actually pretty small. Right? In terms of gigabytes, because right? we're now in the age of you know, 4K high definition television. <laughs> um, you know, so mere transactional data is actually really small. So we can get a huge amount of data into our one cent per gig per month. In fact, the, the most expensive thing about keeping data for the long term is the legal risk it presents if someone decides to come and do discovery later on. Um, Storing the data, cheap as chips. And in fact, the data itself, right, is getting cheaper. Why? Well, it's that whole byproduct thing. So if you think about how we used to get data into IT systems, we used to sit a fleshy thing in front of a keyboard, and the fleshy thing would key, and that would give us data. And that was quite expensive. Right? What we do now is we put the fleshy thing in the, in the seat of a, it's a Volkswagen, I think, it's a Passat, in the seat of a Passat, and on the roof of the Passat, we cover it with like hundreds of thousands of dollars of really expensive instrumentation, and we just drive it around town, and it collects a couple of terabytes of data every hour, all right? and we're effectively collecting all of this data now as a byproduct of driving around town. And in fact, anybody heard of Waze, W-A-Z-E? It's like a, so there we go, someone at the back, it's like a social GPS app. So you use Waze to navigate around town, and it feeds you the GPS data, but at the same time, it's reading where you're going and using that to update its database. So if you go down a previously uncharted street, and a few people go down that uncharted street, Waze goes, oh, there's a new street there. So what are they doing? They are collecting that data as a byproduct of your driving, right? and they are using that to sell as part of their business. Interesting, right? And the other cool thing is that it's now so much cheaper to be precise. I mean, all of us, everybody in the room has a phone, right? And I'd say that 99% of those phones are smartphones, and they've got GPS units and three-dimensional accelerometers. This is a high-precision remote sensing device and we all have one in our pocket, and we just carry it around. So being precise is so much cheaper now, too. So how do we win with, with data, right? You know, we need to do a few things. First, we've got to get the ingredients. First thing is we need to have data, right? And I know that kind of seems silly to say, but we need to we need to be better at collecting more data. Right? We, we've run so many processes within our businesses and so many applications within our businesses, 
and we just throw really valuable byproduct data away. We vent the helium. We've got to stop venting the helium. Right? If you're spending good money on people doing stuff, if you're spending good money on systems doing things, and there's potential to capture data out of that, you should be endeavouring to do that. If we think back to that O'Brien's example earlier in the day with O'Brien's glass and their uh, database of how on earth do I find out which of the 30 models my 3 Series BMW is, they only got that because they had the foresight to collect the byproduct of those conversations that their CSRs were having with customers in terms of helping them to understand their vehicles better. So we've got to be better at collecting that data. We need to have a sort of a, a data mindset when we think about building new systems. We're going to go forward and build a new system. Let's think before we start building that, what data could we be potentially capturing out of that? How might we build this system such that we are able to gather that data out? If you're going to go and do an M&A transaction, something I know a little bit about from the past six months of, uh, of, of stress, think about what data opportunities there are in terms of you know, what data might you be buying into your business as well. Because there's a huge amount of valuable data out there, and there are probably a huge amount of organizations who have data sitting there that may be even more valuable when combined with what you already have. You need a SPA, you need a mechanism to store, process, and access your data. And you don't necessarily need that all at once. Right? You know, the fundamental first thing to do is make sure you don't vent the helium. Look at what data you've got, look at how you can store it. Then it's thinking about how do we process that, right? If we're dealing with really, really large volumes of data, right, then we may need to do some aggregation, some trimming before we do go to storage. And then thinking about how we access that and how do we present that um, to people. Most importantly, right, to really win with data, you need creative minds. Um, you, know, you need people, not so much who are technologists, but who understand how to ask questions of data. Um, you know, these, these are the sorts of people, I, I made the joke, and anybody from the Treasury? So the place to go and get these people, right, is go and, go and hire them out of government departments, right, because government departments are really good at attracting really smart, interesting social sciences and economics and, like, data people, and not paying them very much, right? So there's a huge opportunity to go and pay them more and get these really interesting people who un understand how to tease apart data. Anybody read Freakonomics? That's more than Australia, too. <laughs> um, uh, what about Predictably Irrational by Dan Ariely? That's a great book. I encourage you to, to have a, get the audio book. It's fantastic. Right. They're interesting stories about pulling apart data. Right. Because the, the people doing interesting work these days are the people who are pulling apart this huge mass of data that we have. You know, so I'd encourage you to think outside the box when you think about you know, the sorts of people you hire. Because these data people, they're from, they're from those disciplines that silly commerce graduates like me tend to give a hard time, right, from the social sciences where they're interested in asking peculiar questions and, and, and so forth. And you're going to need some clever tools. Um, and so let's have a look at some of the clever tools that we have at our disposal. And it's going to come and show you some really clever visualization tools. And I'm going to talk a bit about um, some predictive analytics tools. But we're not going to go too deep. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Right. So in terms of clever tools, in terms of how we win with data, coming back to <coughs> Chris's point, we can start with uh, shortening our decision-making cycle. So if you look at the decision-making process, you say, we have uh, middle management, say, I don't know, Dina. She comes up with a very good idea, and she goes to, and talks to CFO. She presents the facts, which all of she needs, to, she thinks, for this idea to support, and then CFO starts asking questions. And what about that? Can you tell me that? What the influence of that? And Dina obviously doesn't have information on her hands. What she does, she takes away all of her documents, goes, and starts research again. So in weeks and days, when <coughs> she does it, she finally finds the answers, comes to CFO again, says, Rob, we need to make a decision, and Rob says, well, okay, can we look at that? 
obviously she goes away, so you, you get the story. So it goes in the cycle. If we bring the cycle with the clever tools which we currently have, and we have it already in our disposal, we already create a competitive advantage in here. So we don't go into endless weeks and days finding the right questions and finding the right information to support them. We come close straight away into the decision-making process, which would be, would be quite nice, to be honest with you. So <clears throat> let me just do, bear with me, just let me duplicate my screen. I'll just show you a couple of things, which we might have a look at. So this one, if you can see that, it's a dashboard. It's effectively an anal analytics model which has been created using Chicago police data. So this is uh, all of the data which Chicago police generated, plus some publicly available data, plus some uh, council generated data about population, socioeconomics, and so on and so forth. And police has done, the Chicago police, this analysis has been done out of necessity. And necessity was because police has limited all very, very limited resources. So in order to be most effective and to get the most out of these resources, they need to know where to deploy them. They cannot just go on streets like this, patrolling this, it's a good idea, but how many police officers will it will take? So they decided to go and analyze all of the things. So they analyzed it by particular suburb. They can see, for example, that uh, in a uh, suburb in uh, far south side, we have lots of burglaries in residence. And in far north east side, we have lots of burglaries in apartments and just barely anything on the streets. So it's no point on sending police just walking on the streets, preventing burglaries on the street. They would be better off sitting some kind of concierges or additional security in the apartments. So that will definitely save them uh, some money and some resources, and hopefully some resources to the public as well. So they have done all sorts of this information. They knew how to ask the right questions. Where they going with that, and what they doing, and all other things. So if we're looking at crime trends per se, so they come up with a conclusion, uh, it's not actually them. If you have uh, read The Economist magazine, they have published quite interesting articles as a curious case of disappearing crime. So this uh, article was about, uh, we have definitely have trends of crime declining. Whether that indicates that we have actually le less crime happening, or that indicates that less crime is being reported, it's a different thing. So that's where you come up with the question, how do I collect my data? So, but with all due respect, we do have uh, data on our hands, and we definitely can see that data of all of the crime uh, types are slowly, kind of very, very slowly uh, declining in this regard. Apart from, it was interesting one, interference with public officer. Apparently we didn't have any interferences with public officer until recently. So again, possibly none, none have been reported. That's all interesting. And a crime by hour, some of the analy analytics, you come up with an answers which are actually quite obvious. So if you look at the graph in here, in the crime uh, trends per hour, you can see that the lowest crime uh, kind of occurrence happened at 5 a.m. So people still have to sleep. You don't have to have a graph. You don't have to go through the common analysis or anything like this. You will know it anyway. You just have it conf confirmed for you. But it would be nice to know. So it's nice to know that it's, you absolutely safely can go through the city at 5 a.m. and pretty much nothing may happen to you. So. Don't go around 24, uh, around 12 p.m. It's not really nice. So, and going from there, where we're going with this, we're actually going to a next phase of our extracting competitive advantage out of data. We go into forecasting. So we go into foreseeing what we're doing with it. Chris is going to show you a bit more, much more on that, and much more sophisticated tool. This tool just showing you the forecast for uh, next month, and it's showing it, uh, this forecast depending on the weather conditions. You possibly won't see it pretty uh, clearly on the screen, but the data includes as well weather conditions. So if it's a clear, if it's a nice, wonderful day, uh, what do we have as the main types of the uh, crime? Or if it's a maybe a heavy rain, what do we have as a result? So we obviously have more narcotics. People depressed wanted to, I don't know. Just, just an opinion. So, and mostly cloudy, 
again, we have a different picture. So it, it is a forecasting based on weather conditions, based on our previous uh, experience, our previous data. We're using uh, a bit of a, uh, different algorithms here to pre pre present it. But this is really a presentation of it. Chris is going to show you how we can do it, uh, how we can do actually analysis on this one. So as I said, we do have quite nice and uh, kind of smart tools, which allow us as well to plot our things uh, over 3D map, uh, on, on interactive map as well, and share our insights with all of our things. So if you can see there, you possibly don't see it very well, but the highest building in here, that's the highest, the highest 3D chart, shows the highest concentration of narcotics, and we can see the gas station intersections quite high if, you lo if we're looking at the uh, crime types in terms of narcotics. So that's kind of, so we can see str straight away quite clear indication with the smart tools. We, we can make analysis and can do different things on that. And looking at this closer, we can definitely have a look at this closer and see what we can uh, make out of it. And as you can see, this is the highest point. Who can tell me, please, uh, where, why is it the highest point and what is the type of building is that? Just guess. It is actually police station. <laughs> it is actually police station, you're absolutely right. The reason for that, because when the in informant gives out information about a narcotic sale, they assign the location of the sale to the police station. And because, of, because they wanted to protect, protect the informant, not that being lazy or anything like this, they just wanted to protect the informant, they assigned it to the police station. So as you can see, it's quite important to have your data, quality data, otherwise your, all your analysis is going to be skewed, right? So that's, uh, yeah, that's all of the things we have at the moment and our, at our disposal, to be able to view the data, to shorten our decision-making cycle, to create a competitive advantage right now, straight away, and have a nice presentation of a 3D map and have a really, really deep dive into our data and make a discovery. So with that one, I'll give it back to Chris. So, uh, yeah, interesting, you can go to America and, and buy narcotics at the gas station. I went to Australia earlier really this week and you can't even buy wine at the supermarket. Um, so Anna actually called out something interesting about the data there with the, the weather. Um, weather's a re weather seasonality time of the year um, are relevant to almost, um, almost any sort of data prediction that you're going to build. Um, and so as we now start to talk about forecasting the future, it's actually worth thinking about, you know, how do I start to build up a data set of some of these sort of utility data sets um, that I can use uh, as I go and try and start to, to do some predictive analytics. So let's talk a little bit about forecasting the future. Because business intelligence has for a long time been, you know, run the weekly report and have it on the CEO's desk on Monday morning. Um, but what we're moving to now is this idea of actually using that data to build models of the way that the world works and the way that our business works, and then using those models as part of our applications. Who's, um, who's shopped at Amazon? Bought a book from Amazon. You've seen that little, uh, people who like this also like that? Right, that's using predictive analytics, right? That is sort of the canonical example of unsupervised learning. It's basically clustering data together. And it does a remarkably good job. Is anybody using predictive analytics at all in their business at the moment? A little bit, like the folks from Sitecore. Awesome. There is a, and, and, and the point cloud man, there is a huge opportunity in this room, then, to, to take some simple steps towards using predictive analytics. So predictive analytics is really sort of furthering our sort of maturity in terms of how we use data, right? So descriptive analytics, you know, what has been going on? Diagnostics, why might that have happened? Um, you know, predictive, how can we predict what might happen in the future? I'll, I'll make sure you guys get these slides. This is from the folks at Gartner, so I'm not, it's, it's from those friendly people. Um, 
And then all the way through, you know, what could we do to actually change the future? You know, can we run simulations to try and simulate what might happen if we change the price of books, if we decide to um, aggressively lower the price of books and not sell some books? You know, so there's a huge, and this really is the opportunity, as, as I think, you know, that show of hands, because we've got a pretty good, you know, selection of New Zealand organisations, there's huge opportunity to pick up some of these predictive analytics tools. Um, and, and, and I'm not going to give you a deep dive in predictive analytics today. Um, I'm going to give you the sort of a super once over lightly. Predictive analytics really takes a couple of, it's two phases. The first is exploration. Get your data, all right, and poke around at your data. Put it in Excel, shred it, muck around with it, explore that data, or have those clever people explore that data. And I'm sure there's heaps of people in here who love Excel, all right, because there's probably a few accountants and those sorts of people. And they really like Excel. I quite like Excel, I like building models and mucking around with data. So the, really the, the hard part of data science, the hard part of predictive analytics is exploring your data. All right? And then the second part is systemization. So let's have a look at some data exploration tools. Um, do I need to, oh, I'm gonna just, oh no, I've got that. That's a clever setup. So this is a little tool called Orange. I quite like Orange because um, it's graphical and it's draggy, droppy, clicky, clicky, and that's kind of how I roll. Um, and way back in sort of the late 1990s, I did uh, what was then called information science at the University of Otago, and I did lots and lots of mucking around with data and text editors and things, and it was pretty awful. Um, has anybody ever heard of the Iris data set? I'm going to just, can I, can I turn this onto juke mode? I hope so. Anyone's ever heard of the IRIS data set? This is kind of like a fundamental data set of learning about data science. Let me show you what it looks like. Who can tell me what an IRIS is for a start? A camera, yeah, camera, eye. When I asked that question in Australia, it's a flower, perfect. When I asked the question in Australia, someone said it's an automated trading platform used by stockbrokers. <laughs> and I said, yes it is. <laughs> so the IRIS data set that we're looking at are flowers. And what they are is, this is basically a list of, uh, of flowers. There's 150, right? And someone's gone and picked some irises and they've measured them. And they've measured what is the length and the width of the sepals, and what is the length and the width of the petals, and they've then had an expert classify those into three different classifications. So you can think of this a bit like, think of instead of irises, we maybe had some data pulled from our CRM system, all right? And that include things like, I don't know, maybe a mesh block and some demographic information um, and other characteristics of our customers. And then down the side here, we had some data like, are they still a customer? Or um, how much have they spent in the last 12 months? Right. Similar sort of scenario. But in our case, we're gonna, we're gonna categorize these flowers. So what we're gonna try and do is we're gonna try and build a model that lets us categorize these flowers so that we could come along later and say, okay, I've just picked a beautiful iris in the Auckland domain. No one's in the Auckland Council, are they? Um, and I've got my micrometer out and I've measured the sepals and I've measured the petals and I now want that model to predict what sort of flower it is. Or I've got a new customer or a potential new customer and I've got some characteristics about them and I want to know whether I should be investing to try and get them to, to join our company or not. So I'm trying to build a model, right? And that model needs to use these widths and lengths to try and sort out the various classes. And so what this tool lets me do is I, I can drag a whole lot of different machine learning, um, you know, effectively 
widgets onto this canvas, but I'm building what's sort of the, the fundamentally simplest machine learning mechanism, which is a classification tree. The beauty of a classification tree is it's the sort of thing that after you've done your data science ninja foo, you can go to the whiteboard and you can actually draw it up and say, okay, let me explain to you the mechanics of classifying irises, right? And you can actually draw out this tree showing, okay, so if the first thing we'll look at is we'll look at petal width, and if we look at petal width, that's immediately going to pull out the iris centosa, right? And then if we look at, um, you know, another characteristic on petal width, we can pull out some of iris virginica, and then if we look at the petal length, we can separate iris versicolor from iris virginica. Right? And again, if you think about this with your customers, you could say, okay, so if we want to you know, separate our customers into, say, churn prediction, customers who are still with us or customers who are left, right? classic scenario, right? Churn is huge with this sort of a model. Um, it's really great to be able to do our, build our churn model and then come back and present this on the whiteboard to help explain to the people in the business how these characteristics about their customers work. And to show you that I'm not just BSing you, let's look at another view, right? So again, what we're effectively doing here is we're plotting our irises and their characteristics in n-dimensional space, right? This is nice math geeky stuff. So think about it in n-dimensional space, but what I can do in this cool little graphical tool is I can bring it down to two-dimensional space, which is a whole lot easier to grok, right? And you can kind of see exactly what that chart was telling us before once we start plotting this out in n-dimensional space. Why? Well, if we were to draw a straight line through there, I can draw a straight line through there, right, and pretty much sheave off those blue ones, which are iris centosa. And if you remember that first branch in our tree, that's what we sheaved off. Right. So again, this lets me, you know, go further and explore other ways that I can view this data, because remember this is effectively, what we're doing is we're plotting the data in n-dimensional space and then trying to build a model that's able to slice that up, all right? So that's exploration, and as I said, I'm a big fan of orange, orange is free, all right? If you've got some data in Excel or something like that and you can export it as tab separated values, you can go and play with it in orange. It's a really cool little tool. Um, it's built by academics for academics, so it doesn't like dealing with lots of data. Um, so I'm going to show you another tool that does. So once you've built your models, and this is great for exploring and building models, um, you probably want to take this sort of thing into production. And so a neat thing with all this cloud computing and this big data, unlimited computing power on tap is you can basically go out and buy, by the hour, machine learning capability. And as long as no one's closed my, they haven't. So this is Windows Azure Machine Learning. You'll see that there's probably a little bit of inspiration in this taken from tools like Orange. This is my um, similar model built up in Azure Machine Learning. So I've built this model in Azure Machine Learning, and effectively I've just sort of ported across the model from Orange. I can train that model, and then it's really cool. I can go down here, uh, and I can go publish that model as a web service. And literally, it will then give me a web service, and I haven't got the iris on, but I've got a slightly different one. It will give me a web service, right, that I can go and call and pass in these characteristics and get the prediction back, right? So literally, it's just on-demand machine learning models, productionized for you. Piece of cake, pay for it by the hour, by the request. Um, so, this predictive stuff, and, and so you don't need to go see Big Blue and, and buy his $100,000 machine learning toolkit, right, with all his $400 an hour consultants, um, because, you know, frankly, we are at a low bar here in sunny New Zealand and sunny Australia. So you're better to actually jump on, you know, sort of the lower levels and, and take advantage of some of these, these easier sort of lower end tools to, to take some baby steps into working with predictive analytics. And I'm going to get the hurry up soon, aren't I? Am I getting the hurry up yet? Who's my hurry upper? Two minutes. So takeaways. There's the, there's the, um, I think that's one of the world's best, you know, trade secrets, right? Because um, anybody ever found anything that tastes anything like Kentucky Fried Chicken that's not Kentucky Fried Chicken? Is the Mexico Fried Chicken, which is pretty good. Um, yeah, so your takeaways, do not vent your helium. Um, capture your data. If you're spending all this money running a business and doing stuff 
and you're generating data, capture it, do interesting, useful stuff with it. Um, and start asking those interesting questions. Right? Um, read a bit of social sciences literature, read a bit of economics literature, um, tease apart your data, and ultimately aim for that situation where you are competing on data and your competitive advantage is derived from something that your competitors cannot get their greasy mittens on. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. That's me. I'm not going to take any questions because I'll, I'll, be, I'll be booted. Um, but I hope you've enjoyed it. I'd love to hear from you. If you want to talk about asking interesting questions or any of this machine learning sort of stuff, uh, call me up, ask any of the Intergen people, just chris.org or say the loud person in the loud shirt. I know exactly who you're talking about, but thank you for coming along to Dynamics Day. Please do your evals. We really do appreciate your feedback. Um, and I'm going to hand over to James, who's going to close out. Thank you, up. Chris. <laughs> Cheers, buddy. All good? Very good. So we started off saying keeping things simple, but I think Chris just blew my mind. Um, and I think the hardest thing about the uh, closed keynote um, is that I stand behind um, you guys uh, between you and, uh, and after dinner drinks. So what we've decided to do this time around is um, make life a little bit simpler and we're bringing the drinks in. Um, <coughs> one thing, just to note, please fill out those eval forms. We really do want to hear from you all. We want to hear how we can actually start improving, uh, improving the, uh, the process for you all. So, what, we'd, what we're going to do is, is if you can fill those, uh, those uh, evals forms out, uh, the team will come around and, uh, and collect them from you. And of course, you know what that means. Um, we're going to do the draw for the uh, surface. So those who are still standing, um, we'll do the draw for the surface uh, after Kevin's, um, Kevin's uh, speech is finished. So I mentioned that the uh, theme was making IT simple. And um, with a slight aside from Chris's uh, uh, machine learning, uh, I think that what we saw today was um, a whole host of opportunities to leverage some really, really clever stuff from Microsoft. Some of the platform components, um, they're all pre-baked, pre-integrated into the, uh, the Dynamics, uh, Dynamics family. I managed to sit in on a whole host of, uh, um, a whole host of sessions, and I learned a whole, uh, whole lot of new things about uh, applications I thought I understood. Um, but it was really, really good to see the, uh, the, the, the theme coming out, um, particularly around um, Power BI and Office 365 and how, the, how those components are actually beginning to surface some really, really rich information from, uh, from these applications. I thought one, of the, one of the points I wanted to make was just that we've perhaps seen some scale here We've seen some scale in terms of um, solutions and outcomes that have been delivered to some, uh, uh, some large organizations, which, which are um, what could only be described as sort of platform level replacements. So you take the O'Brien Smith & Smith uh, glass example, that's an end-to-end -end platform replacement process, a business transformation. But we'll also see some fantastic examples of how um, specific workloads can really, really transform the customer engagement. Um, and thanks to uh, Kerry from Lumino who, who delivered that, uh, that insight. So we've seen solutions today that kind of are really fundamentally changing the whole fabric of an organization uh, to solutions that are um, addressing a discrete workload. We've also seen a whole piece around our intergen direction, and we're really, really excited today um, uh, to, to, to see the kind of new, new world for us all. At the end of the day, intergen remains intergen in New Zealand. Um, we'll still be porting the, uh, the yellowness of, uh, of intergen for many a year, I'm sure. But we really embrace um, Empire as, uh, as our new owners, and it gives us an exciting opportunity to, to leverage the great work that they've done um, across, the, uh, across the Tasman. Simon also alluded to um, how we've organized ourselves to drive some better outcomes in, uh, to, to, to our clients. And I think um, one of the things that, probably the themes that may have come out today is, is that how connected all of the components are. And it isn't, it isn't by, uh, by accident we've done what we've done. 
<clears throat> we've had to respond. In order to make the most out of Dynamics, we have to be able to leverage the best out of the stack. We've got to be able to know how to provision that solution um, uh, as specialists in, in infrastructure, for instance. I've got to say a big thank you again to um, Microsoft uh, for coming along and, um, and sharing with us their strategy and their, their focus um, for, for the uh, dynamic solutions and the, and the broader Microsoft family. It's great to have uh, Microsoft execs coming over from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, overseas to, to really sort of articulate where things are going. It's great also to see um, our uh, MVPs and uh, product specialists sharing with you um, what's coming next. And I was particularly excited to see some of the uh, uh, updates that we've seen for Microsoft CRM uh, coming through. And, uh, and certainly the, uh, there's some very, very um, I can say cool things, actually, to be honest, cool things that are coming out of uh, uh, NAV with particularly their tablet, um, tablet features are just, um, just outstanding. And what this event is all about trying to give you uh, an insight into what's coming next so that you can use that insight to drill, drive into your, your, um, your business plans. Um, and I hope that you've had the opportunity to extend your reach into um, those discussions with, with our specialists here. I know that they're still, um, still around the room, so please do grab them after, after this session and, and uh, catch up and understand a bit more about uh, some of the context and, and uh, detail behind the discussions that we've had today. We've also seen how we can extend. We've seen how we can extend the solutions um, uh, and leverage some of the platform components. So um, I'm in a great session I sat through um, around Power BI on top of Dynamics AX, uh, optimizing the supply chain using natural query. I mean, I thought that was amazing. We were typing, typing in little words just saying, what's, what's my worst performing stock, uh, or top worth, 10 worst performing stock? Show me that by, um, in a pie chart, for instance. I mean, once upon a time, you needed a degree in data science to get this stuff out, and now you just have to use natural words. We also saw, again, the, um, the use of standard tools and the power of the platform and how all this stuff is being brought together. So it's been particularly exciting to see how um, these pieces are really sort of beginning to, to uh, sing and dance together and bring the most value out of, um, out of the investment in Dynamics. So I guess what I want to do is, um, is to say, first of all, thanks. Um, I mean, thanks, first of all, to um, our sponsors. Uh, Click Dimensions, which I've already mentioned before. Click Dimensions is a, um, a solution that sits in Dynamics CRM and provides a great deal of connectivity to your, 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 your customers and insights into how to, how to better market to them. And certainly, um, uh, Stephen Foster, I'm sure you all know in this room, is a, a real advocate for uh, Click Dimensions. And um, certainly, if you need any more information, please do go and talk to him. And Microsoft, thanks for the support again um, uh, in terms of making this, uh, this event um, what it is. It's really, really great to have both um, the, the, their involvement and obviously having the, uh, the Surface devices out there and uh, something we can go and play with. But it's really awesome uh, to have their, their involvement uh, and their sponsorship as part of this process so that you can engage um, as much with them as we can with the Intergen team. And get it, I've already mentioned, but actually having people across um, from uh, overseas, uh, I think adds a little bit of weight to, to these events. We need to understand a bit more about what's going on in the big wide world, and it's great to have the Microsoft execs coming down and explaining to us where, the, where their vision is and how that's going to actually intertwine with what we're trying to get out of, um, out of these applications. So again, thank you to the exec team for making the time um, to uh, uh, come down to um, Aotearoa. I'm sure that putting an event on like this, you take no surprises that actually it takes quite a lot of work. Um, I think we started conversations about this about five and a half months ago, was it, Sally? Yep. Um, and we promised, promised ourselves that this year was going to be smoother, simpler, and that we were going to get everything completed way before, um, way before the day. 
So as per normal, we were scrabbling around at 7.30 this morning getting everything completed. But thank you very much to the event organisers, um, which uh, without whom we just wouldn't be able to stage such an event in New Zealand and, of course, Australia. And f um, finally, the presenters. I mean, we've got 37 people here from Intigent, and a number of these guys have actually presented here today um, providing content. But it's not just those um, sort of 45 minutes of fame that they've got up on the stage. What we've had to do is to work pretty hard in um, getting this stuff uh, developed and uh, the content thought of and the themes running through the whole, uh, whole process. So I just wanted to say a, um, a big thank you to all of the four main groups. And I really think you've done an amazing job um, today and brought a great lot of content. So a round of applause, please, for those guys. And the next one is really for you. Thank you very much um, for coming here uh, and making that time and investment. I already said in the, uh, clo in the opening keynote, it really is, is that your attendance here makes this um, a pretty special event for us. And we really like the opportunity to, to engage and get a little bit more of an understanding of what's going on in your business. Um, and certainly we hope to extend that beyond um, uh, this, this afternoon. So hopefully we can catch up uh, later on for a, a few drinks and, uh, and understand a bit more about where your business is going.